uh, I haven't mentioned this in a while, but if you ever come into church and you feel like I can play an instrument and drums is one of those or keyboard or bass or something like that, I mean, they're all here. We just need the uh, talented person. Uh, any of you ladies over there, can you play drums? No? Maybe? <laughs> all right. Grab a Bible. You're going to need it. Um, always push that because I don't want you to walk out of here with man Dave said a whole bunch of cool stuff Uh, I want you to walk out of here with his word in your hand thinking man I need to read that again or I need to look at that again or I want to tell somebody about that or let me show you this and so definitely want a Bible when you come there are Bibles in the back you can take one you can take ten I don't care take as many as you want give them out Um, I will always have Bibles available to me it's the most important thing that I can give you so Grab it and open it. You're going to turn to John. So John is the fourth book of the New Testament, so it's towards the back. Um, It's the fourth gospel. And um, it may feel kind of weird because for two years we were doing the story of God and we were moving through this book chronologically from front to back and we got all the way through Revelation last week. So now it seems like we're backing up, but we're just moving to the next thing. And the next thing we're going to focus on is worship from through the holidays. That's going to kind of be a theme that we deal with through the holidays, but maybe from a slightly different perspective because most people, I feel like, want to spend time defining it. Uh, I don't want to do that. I want to talk about doing it. Um, It gets brought up like it's this logical argument, like this debatable thing. It's not. It's an offering of love is what it is in its most pure sense. It's a decision to act on something, but not just an emotional response to something. And I feel like we confuse that a lot. It's a decision that you're making to do something. So what does that mean for worship? Like I said, we're not going to define the word. We're going to define the action, sort of. What does it mean when you do it? That, that's what we're talking about today and in the days ahead and and through Christmas, and we'll change it up a little, but that'll be the way we move. So is it the music? Did we just finish the worship part? Was it the prayer, right? Is it thinking about him? Is it uh, being quiet? Is it something that's loud? Does the music style matter? Everybody usually says no, but then when they hear something they don't like, that no changes real fast. Everybody says no because they put that music in two categories, Christian music without drums and Christian music with drums, you know. Um, so does it make, does it require tears? Is it not worship unless we're crying? Is it lengthy? Do you have to be in a, po- get, in, get into a posture, so to speak, first? Do you have to warm up? Um, or is it short? Is it fast? Can it be quick? Where does church fit into that? Is the music, the worship, is the prayer the worship, is the sermon the worship? Well, all of them can be, or none can be. Even the music can potentially not be. It depends on how you respond. Are you giving glory to God through it? Is it causing you, this is the thing, is it causing you to consider how amazing God is? Whatever it is. Is it causing you to consider how amazing God is, is it making you want to tell him? Then you're starting to find yourself in a posture of worship, regardless of what's going on around you or in the moment. Otherwise, you might just be coming here doing church, and people are real good at that. It's not worship. You can say we came and we worship, but did you? We came and we sang the songs, but did you? You know? So what does it take to make worship happen? Well, today we're going to look at uh, the word seeing, um, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, but we're going to look at the word seeing in terms of what does it make to worship, make worship happen. So many of y'all know I was in a band. I remember being uh, at a concert right when I came out of the world. Like I just got it, just changed my life and brought me out of the world. And I was just starting to get into this band, and we were kind of a rock, rock hard band that was doing Christian music, but I remember um, being at a concert of another band that we ended up doing a lot of touring with. It was called Disciple. They still tour now, and they're hard rock Christian music, and you can see see right now some of you are going, how is that possible? See, you're already proving my point about style of worship doesn't matter. 
you know. Uh, but I remember being there, and they did this one song, which became a favorite song of mine, called One More Time. And I am, like, down here towards the front of the stage in the crowd. And the lyrics say this. It's not the whole song, but this is a piece of it. It says, another night I sit alone. Another night my heart is so heavy. I can't believe that it's beating on its own. I know you tell me to be glad when trials come to me, but instead I always question if you love me at all. But I know you know me, Jesus, and I know you listen to my cry. And I'll praise you and give you thanks for you have lifted me to carry me one more time. I'll praise and give you thanks for you've lifted me to make me see that my life is in your hands. Coming out of what I came out of at that moment in time, I was so messed up by those words while everybody in the room was singing it. It wasn't a big room. It was probably twice the size of the one we're in. Uh, but I got, I hit my knees in the floor in the middle of the crowd, you know, not to stand out. I just couldn't help it. Like, I was just emotional. I don't even know if I was crying or laughing. I don't know if I was overcome with joy or or what, I, but I just did. And then other people were, I didn't start something. I just realized other people were doing it too. I mean, I wasn't the only one. And this is a very hard, edgy rock song. But it didn't matter. I also remember sitting in my chair at my house, studying scripture and reading through some really difficult theology, which I'm not going to break down right now, but really wrestling with this theological struggle and becoming aware, just I, and Molly was there, she remembers, but I became aware, God just loves me. Like, I, I would have told you I knew that, but I became aware of it. Like, in, he, just because, I think there's nothing in me that's worth it at all. There's no reason. I, I, I have done nothing that's caused him to love me. He just, just does. And I'm not worth it, man. And I, again, just got overcome. I, I went from tears to laughter to tears to laughter. And I just kept saying it. I remember being, many of you have done this, at the Grand Canyon after dark, laying there on the edge of the rim in absolute silence, absolute darkness, and seeing stars that it is impossible to explain. I mean, there's just no way to explain what your eyeballs are looking at because there are so many. And again, being overcome, and I just started saying, thank you, Lord. Like, for what? I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> you know, like, I just got moved. I remember being in prisons and seeing people doing life in prison and whatever else, but yet they hear a, a song sung like what they were singing earlier and they got their hands in the air and they're worshiping. Or they hear a message from me or a preacher or somebody who's there and they got their hands up and they're worshiping in, this, in the sermon. And I'm thinking, these people are doing life in prison. How, how can they have that same attitude that we do in church or should? A lot of us don't. Well, it's because it's not about the environment. And we're going to dive in here in just two seconds. I'm just setting this up because we're moving into something different. It's not about the environment. It's not about manipulation of emotions. It's about your heart becoming aware of who Jesus is. And then that will make you recognize who you are. And if that doesn't make you worship, I'm telling you, you don't know him. I love you. But you need to hear me say, you don't know him if that doesn't make you worship to think about those things. So here's your kind of uh, post in the ground, signpost. I always give you one. This is not scripture. This is just me, some, a thought to hold on to as we walk through this. All we need in order to worship is a moment to consider what Jesus has already done in our lives. That's very simple, but it's saying a lot. All we need in order to worship is a moment to consider what Jesus has already done in our lives. I'm not defining that moment. It doesn't matter. So look in John chapter 9. Look in verse 1. We'll move through this quick. Uh, it says, Jesus is passing by and he sees. I'm not reading all of this. I'm just focusing on a couple of truths from it. So as Jesus is passing by, he sees a, a, a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? 
And Jesus said, it was not this man uh, that sinned or his parents, but that the works, it was not that this man sinned or that he or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This is such a profound question. Excuse me. We do this all the time. Who sinned? Like, even ourselves, when things start going bad for us, a lot of times we get tempted to think, okay, what am I doing wrong? You know what I'm saying? Well, okay, I know I sinned last week. Is this because of that? Or I know I've been doing this thing, and it's wrong, and is that why nothing's working out? Now, it could be. It could be. That does happen sometimes. But this is not the case here. Like, this is something totally different. This is... In essence, a birth defect, you could look at it that way. And I'm, I'm not, this got nothing to do with people being weak or not weak or whatever. That's got nothing to do with anything. This is just from birth, a, a th- thing that should be operating is not operating. Um, and so, obviously, some punishment from God, some problem from God. Well, the disciples here actually had in mind Scripture, Exodus 34, 7. You can look at it in your own time, but it talks about generational sins. And, and this is not the context for what that means, but that's what they're applying it. The father's sin has been passed on to the son, and now that's the case. But they're also saying, or is he, as an unborn baby, what has he done that he's born Blind. You see that when they said, or is it sin he did? Well, he was born blind. So if you're implying he did a sin, you're implying he did it before he was even born. And that's not, that was coming from the Hebrew leaders at the time. They had some wild teachings on this. I went back and looked up some of it and studied on it a little because it got fascinating to me. But they, they thought that either God was looking into the future and seeing sins that this guy was going to commit. And so ahead of time, God made him blind as punishment for what he would do. Or that God did him a solid, and God said, hey, you're going to do horrible things with your eyes, so I'm going to take them from you. But then he was still cursed for that. Uh, Or the even more common thought is that in the womb, children have uh, inclinations offered to them. And they're either, unborn children, they're either offered the inclination of good or the inclination of bad. Most, they say, choose inclination of good, Um, but there are those who choose inclination of bad, and they do horrible things like kick their mama in the womb. That's disrespecting your mom. That's how you know this baby has done an inclination of bad, and so God is therefore cursing. And it got to the point that in some cases, uh, women were allowed to sue their children when they became adults for having kicked them in the womb. I I was just blown. I was like, I can't believe this is real, what I'm reading, but it's true. So that's what these disciples kind of have in mind. Like, he's born blind, so, you know, what's the deal here? But Jesus says it's not about that. He does not say. That's why I carefully reread it. He does not say they didn't sin. Never said that. He said this is not about sin. He didn't say they were innocent of sin. He said this is not the reason he's born blind. The reason, he says, is this man's going to bring glory to God by the works of God that are displayed through his birth defect. Wow, if we could pull that one into our world, huh? That God could gain glory through what we would call birth defects. Think of how many children have been spared a horrible life uh, through some pre, pre-noticed or predetermined birth defect. You know, I'm not trying to jump down a huge rabbit hole here. You know what I'm saying? Whether kids are aborted or forgotten or abandoned or whatever else because we don't want them to be born that way or have those battles. What if God was going to do a miracle? And I'm not saying he was going to fix their birth defect. I just mean what if he could use that for his glory? What if he did it on purpose? That sounds horrible. Would God do such a horrible thing? That's why I tell you, take this home. Read it. You might find some things in there that surprise you. So, Jesus 
goes on with the story here. Jesus makes mud. I'm not going to read it. Well, you can read it in your own time. But Jesus makes mud with some spit. He rubs it on this guy's eyes right here. It's kind of pointing to the fact that he's the creator because how did he make man in Genesis chapter 2? took dirt from the ground and made man. So it's kind of pointing to that a little bit. But he tells them, tells the guy to go wash his face off in this pool. He's still blind at this time. And this pool is not getting, is not easy to get to. Uh, it was down outside of the edge of the city and it was quite the hike and it was up and down hill and all this. Wouldn't have been terribly easy for this blind man to get there, but he does, which tells you what? He had some faith, right? He had some significant faith, at least that something's going to happen, that Jesus is up to something here in any, ascent, any uh, sense. So he goes and is obviously committed to Jesus' words, but why would Jesus do that? Why did Jesus spit? make mud, rub it in his eyes, and then send him all the way down a hill to wash if he can speak the universe into creation. Why do that? Well, for a few reasons. One, that pool was a very popular place. Very popular place because there was a lot of water in this particular pool. So that tells you there's going to be a lot of people there. It's also a Sabbath, and it's also during the Feast of Tabernacles or one of the main celebrations where everybody has to come to Israel. There were three. That was one. I mean, not Israel. Well, Israel, but Jerusalem. That was one of three. So there would be mass crowds in Jerusalem, and it's the Sabbath, so there would be people out. And then on top of all of that, now this is a common place, so this would be witnessed by a lot of people. Um, and on top of that, This wasn't just any miracle. People did miracles back then. There were other miracles that were done. The disciples ultimately do miracles. In fact, there were false prophets that did miracles. In the times of the end that are ahead of us, it talks about false prophets that will do miracles. But that's not the start of that. If you go back to Moses, remember, we do this every time we do our upper room. Back in the time of Moses, in the plagues, the Egyptian magicians did miracles too. So there were, there were miracles that would happen, but this is different. There were three miracles that the Jews expected to point to the Messiah. Three very specific, they called them messianic miracles, that they expected only the Messiah could do. One was healing a Jewish leper. Jesus did that. And go back and read that. Nobody else had ever done that. One was casting out a mute demon because they believed you had to get the demon to speak and identify and talk to you. Jesus did that. We talked about both of those stories in the past. And the third one, the triumph, the one that only God himself could make happen through the Messiah would be to heal a birth defect, like blindness or whatever, because... Birth defects were considered divine judgment and incurable. So if you could cure a birth defect that God cursed somebody with, that meant you were either equal to or above God to reverse what he'd done. So this was a messianic miracle that's happening, and this should have been the moment, like, Man, he, he, he's doing, this is something the Messiah, he's got to be the Messiah, right? But confusion comes here because of the way he did it. He broke three of the Hebrew leaders' laws. Not the laws of Moses, not scripture, but three traditional laws. He broke three. <laughs> One was using spit to heal somebody. You're not allowed to do that. You're, you could use wine on eyes. That was the prescription for healing eye problems or eye conditions was wine, not spit. And specifically not supposed to spit. That's the one thing that you're not, why, who knows, but you're not supposed to do that. He did that. He also made mud. That seems like an insignificant thing, but that was an act of defying the Sabbath, according to the traditions of the people, that he worked, he made something on the Sabbath. In that sense, that was also wrong. Uh, And then he healed the guy, the act of healing the guy, on the Sabbath. So those three things that he did broke the laws of the Jewish leaders, not God's law, the Jewish leaders, but they made no difference. 
to break their laws was to kind of break God's laws. They put them right up there. So Jesus heals a man born blind by their own beliefs. He should be recognized as Messiah. The whole entire thing happens in front of everybody. Everybody sees it. But he also broke the law to do it, at least in the way these people see it. So they want an explanation. How did he do it? How is this possible? How is this possible that he does this thing that only the Messiah is able to do, but he also breaks your laws to do it? How, how is that possible? We're confused. So they bring the guy to the leaders. He gets examined. He gets interrogated. His parents get brought in and interrogated. They kick it back on him. They interrogate him. They bring him back in. And the threat here is if you recognize Jesus as the Messiah, you're out. Now, out for us is pitiful. If you got put out of this church, uh, which, which I can't imagine that happening, but I'm saying if you got put out of this church, for us in our day, it would mean either A, you're done with church because church did you wrong, or B, you're going to go to the other one. And if you don't like it, you'll go to the other one. If you don't like it, you'll go to the other one. That was not the case here. This is it. You're out of the whole community. Like they all worship around a synagogue and a temple, and that's that. And if you're out of that, you don't have friends anymore. You, you don't, Jewish people of which you are one living among will have nothing to do with you now. They're not going to hire you. You've been cast out. You're wicked. You're gross. You're disgusted. I mean, this is a big deal. Casting him out is not just a simple little thing like we don't want you in church anymore. Society is done with you. And that's what's being threatened and so here we come to verse 24. This man has now been interrogated, and he's back. Verse 24 for the second time. It says, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. What that means is stop glorifying Jesus for this. Stop talking about Jesus. If you've been healed, you glorify God, not Jesus. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. I love they say we know that. He answered, the guy says, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, though I was blind, now I see. Man, come on, brother. One of my favorite lines in the whole Bible. Like, I don't have all the answers here, but I know I was blind, and I know I see now. You know, I, I don't know what to tell you about, you know, I can't answer everything about how he made the universe, what he did before. I can't explain how he can be sovereign, and man still has responsibility at the same time. I can go down a bunch of theological rabbit holes, and I don't have answers to every little thing, but I can tell you this. For me personally, I was a lost, drug-addicted piece of trash, and now I'm priceless to the Creator. I was blind, but now I see. When I don't have any other answers, I could still say that. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I know who he is. I know once upon a time I didn't know who Jesus is, but I know now. You know, I know now. And the irony here, by the way, is that he is, when they say give glory to God, that's exactly what he's doing by glorifying Jesus. And I could walk you through it all, but we did that. For two years, we did the story of God. Who's God? If you didn't get that out of the story... Go back and watch the whole thing again. Jesus is that person. It's the story of Jesus. In fact, one quick note, we could go to just tons of them, but here's a good one really quick out of Jesus' own mouth. Matthew 4, 9, Jesus is being uh, tempted by Satan, and he says to, Jesus says to Satan, or excuse me, Satan says to Jesus, all of the nations of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, all these things, I'm going to give them to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Yet in a moment, you'll see this blind man worship Jesus and he fully accepts it. Jesus' own mouth say you worship God alone, but then Jesus accepted worship. Either he was a hypocrite and a liar, or he was God. One, only options. Um, Jesus says this man was born blind so that the works of God might be displayed. Jesus healed him. That's the work of God. It's laced all in here. It's laced all in here. It's not like it's hidden. John 20, 28, when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to his disciples. I love this one too. Thomas, who is Thomas famous for? 
doubt, right? And this is the moment of doubt. And, you know, I'm not going to believe till I touch his hands and touch the holes. And Jesus shows up, and Jesus says, come here, bro. Come here. I love that. I love that Jesus doesn't, like, shoot him down. How could you not believe after all this? He says, okay, you want to touch him? Come touch him. Never does. Doesn't have to. Immediately says, my Lord and what? My God. Straight to Jesus. To recognize Jesus is to know that he's God. And that will always lead you to worship him. Always. How can he be God? How can the Father, the Son, and the Spirit see? Okay, I can, we can talk about it. We can wrestle with it. But at some point in time, I go, I, well, I don't know, but I know I was blind, and now I see. <laughs> I know that I may not be able to explain that perfectly, but I know I see him, and it's, who he, it, it's him. It's him. And I say this a lot, but I'll say it now because I brought it up. Don't ever get tripped up over that argument. The fact that he breathed a universe into existence means he's a little over our head, you know? So if you can't explain how Father, Son, and Spirit can be one and yet three, that's okay. You can't make a planet either. You know what I mean? It's fine. It doesn't have to be understood. It just needs to be accepted and believed. But to refuse to acknowledge who Jesus is is to make the blind more blind. There's no neutral. The more you refuse to recognize who he is, the more you drop into this hole of blindness. Look what happens in verse 30. The man answered, well, this is an amazing thing, says to these guys, because by now he's over it. I love this dude. I, when I get to heaven, we're going to sit down and we're going to talk. This is my kind of guy. Like, he's sarcastic and everything. Like, Josh and I will have fun with this guy. All right, look, he says, wow, this is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from. And yet he opened my eyes. Like, y'all are supposed to be the religious leaders. Y'all are supposed to be the one that knows Scripture. Y'all are supposed to be the ones that say nobody can open the eyes of a blind man born blind except for the Messiah. And I'm the guy born blind, and my eyes are open, but y'all have no idea where he comes from. Hmm. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anybody is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. There's a little nugget in there for you. If you're a worshiper of God, he listens. If you got prayer requests, I'm just throw this stone at you real fast because I throw it at myself too. But if you got prayer requests and you're asking God for stuff, but you don't make any time to worship him at all, you, maybe you come to church, but you stand here and we sing these songs and you, you, you look like a frozen statue and you just walk through it and then you get out of here and you go home and you don't think about it again. And you wonder maybe why, is he listening? Is he sleeping? Is he out cold? Does he care? Like, well, I can tell you if you are a worshiper of God, he listens. Look at verse 32. Never since the world, this guy continuing to mock them, never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man, Jesus, were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered, you're born in utter sin, and you're going to teach us. That's epic. We could camp on that forever, but it's obvious what they're saying, so I'm not going to. And they cast him out. I love this. Jesus heard, it goes on, that they had cast him out and having found him. So what does that tell you that Jesus has done? He heard what happened. Did, did it happen? Is it like he heard that moment? Was he standing outside? No, we don't. We got a little time frame here. We don't know how long it was, day or two maybe. But he gets the word that this guy's been cast out, and he goes to find him. Like he already did him a solid, right? He already gave him eyes. He already healed him. He could have just let that be the end of it, but 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 he knows he's been cast out for it. He knows that he, this man's made a stand. For, for Christ, and he's been ostracized by the whole community, and he make, Jesus goes and finds him. And he says, and I love this, Jesus doesn't just say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm the man of all of your hopes. I'm the guy. Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Um, that's another reference to who the Messiah would be known by. Verse 36, he says, who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Now, how does he not know? Well, he couldn't see. 
Jesus healed him, said, go wash, but he never saw him. He went to that pool blind. Jesus didn't accompany him. So now he's seeing Jesus with his eyes open face to face for the first time. Maybe he recognized the voice a little, but, you know, there's crowds then and crowds now. And either way, he's not sure that this man is the one that healed him. Yet, he says, Jesus said to him, you have seen him now. And it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. We got all these sinner's prayers, man. We got all these complicated phrases that everybody's got to repeat after me. That's enough right there. Lord, I believe. Can you define sin? Can you define and explain the cross? Can you qu- properly explain the resurrection? Whatever. It doesn't say anything about it. It just says, Lord, I believe. I believe. And I'll prove it because he worships him. He worships him. And like I said, we could talk about how worship looks. We could talk about what we worship We worship self, we worship images, we worship money, we worship whatever. We could talk about that. We could spend time defining the word worship, but I don't want to do that. I want to be super practical right here with what we're looking at. We we expect something external to move us to worship in our world. That's what we do. We come in here, and, and, and I'm using here as an example, but it could be anywhere else. It could be a concert you go to. It could be a pastor that, that you're expecting to be passionate and thrilling and exciting. It could be a, anything. It could be the Bible. Why is the Bible so boring? You know, Leviticus is so boring. Like we, we want to be inspired in some way, and we want to be moved. We want If we're going to do a stage and we're going to do a band, it's going to be high quality, so... We're going to have the best vocals, and we're going to have the best mics, and we're going to have lights, and we're going to have fog, and we're going to get everybody powerfully moved. I'm not taking shots. I can't Listen, I moved here from this church, okay? So I'm not taking shots. I'm just making a point. Like, we create this environment, but we want people to raise their hands. We want them to clap. We want them to kneel. We want them to do whatever. But if our physical actions don't reflect an internal position, then it's just a preference. I prefer to worship this way. I prefer to do it like this. But when your internal position changes, you don't need it, any of it. You don't even care anymore. For instance, we choose to clap for the same reason we say amen. That's the way it should be. So when you're in a service, And you're moved to clap. You're clapping just like you would if you were saying amen. You've heard something powerfully said. You've heard lyrics in there that were powerful to you and they were strong for you. And they they made you want to clap. And and, and for whatever reason, we get that all mixed up with applause. So so then we don't want to do it because we don't want to applaud the, the, and I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about the church as a whole. We don't want to applaud the performance. It's not about the performance. That's such a, a holy sounding thing, isn't it? You know, but it's not, a, nobody's applauding a performance. You're just celebrating, like, God, you're awesome. Like, did you hear those words? Did you hear the words that just came out of my mouth in this song? And you want to clap, you know, just like you want to say amen, yes. It's just like when you hear a speech. And the speech is amazing. If you're big into politics and your favorite politician says everything you want to hear, what are you doing the whole time? Yes, yes, clap, clap, amen, yes, yes. But we come in church and it's just froze. And if we clap, that's wrong because then we're we're applauding somebody. No, you're not. You're doing the same thing. You're just celebrating what was said or that's what you should be doing. I'm not saying you got to clap. You may not clap. You might just bow your head a minute. You might just smile. You might just laugh. I'm not saying you have to do those things. And, and let me finish with this. Let's picture it a minute. What do you think John meant when he said the guy, this is, the, if you get nothing else I'm saying, stop a minute and listen to what I'm saying right here because we're pretty much done here. What do you think John meant when he said the guy worshiped him? What 
What do you picture he did? Doesn't say. What do you think he did? Yeah, raise his hands. Did he take a knee? Did he bow on the ground? Did he wave his hand in the air? Did he hug him? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't say. We could mine down and say, what did culture like, blah, 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 do all this stuff. But I, I, we ain't got to do that. It's not necessary. What did he do? What did the woman caught in adultery do? How did she worship him? How did, the, how did Thomas worship him, the one we just talked about? My Lord and my God, what'd that look like? Was he crying? Was he laughing? Was he broken? Was he on his face? Was he jumping up and down and celebrating? I don't know. What about Mary? Caught in prostitution. How'd she worship him? We know some of what she did. If you don't know the story, look it up. It's in your Bible. What about the disciples? How did they worship him? We could go as far as saying they worshiped him in their death. And we'll talk about that next week because we'll talk about sacrifice next week. They followed him obediently to this. So what do we do with this? How do we walk out of here with this? Well, what if coming to church was less about, this is all you got to think about. What if it was less about getting something for your week, which is the way we treat it? God, give us something we can use throughout the week. What if it was less about that and more about what can I leave here? What can I bring to God and give him today? What if it, we, we weren't praying every week, Lord, we want to feel your presence. Lord, we want to experience your presence. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I'm saying what if we said we just want to give you whatever. I don't, I don't need you to give me anything. You already gave me more than I deserve. I want to give you something. What, what if that was the focus of church on Sunday? What if that was the focus of your day when you get up in the morning? God, I... I could pray all these requests I got, all these things I need. They're okay to do that. I'm not saying that. We're talking about worship right now. What if you just got up and said, God, I just got to tell you how amazing you are. Let me just start with this, you know. And you know what? That's all I got right now, but I'm going to come back because you're too cool. So I'm going to come back, and we're going to talk some more in a minute because something cool is going to happen that I'm going to say thank you. Thank you. You know what? My car started. Thank you for that. If you got a car like mine, you mean that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, let me ask you guys to stand up. We're going to finish right there. Let me ask you guys to stand up. And uh, we're going to do another song. We always do one more song. And I'm going to ask you guys, close your eyes, and just take a minute. And this is not about being uber spiritual. I'm not hiding anything that's going on. Everybody's coming up to get the, ready for the song and all that. This is about you just kind of shutting everything out. I know there's people around you. But just take a minute and, and just process this. Like, where are you at with worship? And, and if you're, it, listen, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you, it, you, you can't worship. It can't worship who you don't know. It starts right there. And it's not complicated. You just say, Lord, I believe. I'm, I'm asking you, like, do you see him today? Like you've heard talk about him, you hear talk about him, you know stories about him, you, maybe you've heard sermons about him, maybe you're hearing this today, and you're like, you know what, I think I see that, I think I get it, I think I see him. He does love me. He did die for me. He did defeat death for me. I don't have all the answers, but, but I see if that's you today, you, you don't have to have anything fancy to plan, just tell him, Lord, I believe Jesus, I believe. I trust you. And then come up here and tell us. You don't got to walk up here right now. Just sometime before you leave, come grab me and say, man, listen, God woke me up today. Um, and if you're here today and you're thinking about what God's doing in your life, you got things you're struggling with or you're wrestling with and you need a minute, man, hey, this is it. Take it. If you want to take a knee where you're at, if you want to move around, you can move around. I don't care. But let's take a minute during this next song. And let's just worship him well. Lord, I love you. You're awesome. Thank you for these things, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>